Uh, welcome to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh, everyone. Um, wherever you are in the world, I know we have quite a large international audience quite often. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. This is what we've got coming up tonight. I've just got a few introductory slides, it won't take more than a few minutes. And then um, the main event of the evening is Dr. James Dyer, who is in Texas at the moment, who will be telling us about history of innovations in telescopes. And there's been a lot of that going on recently, but um, this is probably more historic. I don't know how updated that will be. Let's find out. Um, this is really uh, for members and um, potential visitors as well. Uh, we run quite regularly, well, most years, something called a telescope help shop. Um, and this next one is going to happen on the 16th of March this year. St. Thomas's Church in uh, the Guile Hall in Kostofen, and it is aimed at uh, beginners. At this time of year, a lot of people have bought a new telescope or got one given to them at Christmas, and they're not quite sure what to do with it, or they've had one for a long time, and it's been sitting in a cupboard. And this is um, a really good opportunity to work out how to use it. They're always really popular, usually oversubscribed, um, but people find them really useful. They are really... Um, very uh, basic level they are really for beginners and how to actually use a telescope but we always plan them when the moon will be up in the daytime assuming the weather's good and surprisingly it actually has been for the last few years um, so you actually get to, to to look at the moon through through the telescopes as well um, so that's what's going to happen in march and um, the first spaces will go to the to the members of society and then we'll put any that are left um to the, to the public and um should be really good as uh, as always and we will need um the usual members of the society to help out at, at that event as well but <clears throat> we have more info to follow that will be um on the website so keep an eye out for that uh, we'll do that these are pictures from the last few years as well always really popular um not much else from, from me really but there's lots of ways of staying in touch with us we have a lot of stuff going on um online and in person our website um, has all that information. We're on Facebook, X, Twitter. Um, a lot of our, our videos from our past uh, meetings are on our YouTube channel. We have a very active imaging and observing group, and we have um, Flickr groups for uh, that from people's own equipment. And we also have one for our remote observatory in Spain, as a rule, as we call it, the AAC Remote Observatory. And we also know on the, the new Blue Sky social media app as well. This is what we've got coming up for the next couple of months. Uh, we ha we have meetings, uh, talks planned for the for the whole of the year, but these are the next few. On the second of February, we'll have a, a hybrid meeting, so that means we'll be um, at the Augustine United Church in Edinburgh. We'll be streaming it live to YouTube for visitors and to Zoom for our members, and that's about um, gravitational wave astronomy from Professor Martin Hendry. On the 7th of February, we have our Imaging and Observing Group meeting. That's our monthly one. That's for ASC members. And it's a, a great place to, to learn about astronomy and imaging and observing together. On the 16th of February, we have an online-only talk from Mary McIntyre. Mary gave us uh, part one of her History of Women in Astronomy last year. And this is part two. And the first one was really good. So I think that the second one will be good as well. So that will be on Zoom for members and on YouTube for visitors. And on the 1st of March, we have a members' night, and that will be a number of short presentations from members. Um, that won't be on YouTube on this occasion, but uh, visitors are welcome to um, join us in Edinburgh at the Augusta United Church. I realise for the more remote of you, that may, might not be possible, but you'll be definitely welcome at that. So that is it uh, from me at the moment. I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, James, if I can... Uh, hand over to you, and uh, Dr. James Dyer will tell us about the history of innovations in telescopes. Thank you, James. Thank you, President Mark. Let me um, share my screen here first. I originally put together this talk to present at the annual meeting of the Astronomical League last July, which was held in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, and I'm honored to present this same uh, talk tonight to uh, uh, the Scottish astronomers and others who are tuning in around the world here. It's really an honor to be here tonight. And as uh, President Mark said, this, this talk is going to concentrate more on the history of innovations as we go through the centuries. 
I'm going to take you through a walkthrough time. Uh, and I don't cover every innovation that was ever made in telescopes, especially since so many have been made in recent years. So I'll apologize if there's a favorite telescope that you have that I don't talk about tonight. <laughs> Well, before there were telescopes, we just had eyes to look at the stars. And uh, for most of us, as we got older, our eyes tended to deteriorate. So then eyeglasses were invented. And uh, the oldest surviving eyeglasses uh, date back to the 13th century in Italy. Uh, I've got a sort of a picture one on the upper left here. Uh, they were mostly um, used for reading and uh, mostly by monks, since most people back then were, were illiterate and uh, the monks were also copying all the the uh, the um, documents they copied to make copies to go around the world. And then the bottom picture here is a, actually a, a drawing done by Leonardo da Vinci, where he actually um, invents the contact lens. Although they, there was no way to make contact lenses there, they really date back to his innovation with contact lenses. Uh, the it, it was only a matter of time after centuries of opticians creating eyeglasses before opticians put the right combination of lens together to determine you can get magnification out of them. And so the early telescope makers were really eyeglass makers or opticians. And uh, the, the first three known telescopes that were uh, created were by Hans Lippersche, Zacharias Janssen, and Jacob Medius, all Dutch opticians. Uh, Jansen actually wasn't an optician, but his father was. So his father probably did the invention and he's the one who marketed it. All three of these gentlemen applied for patents for the telescope. Um, early telescopes were primarily used for um, earthbound observations, such as surveying and, and for military use. And these early telescopes uh, had very long focal ratio or focal lengths or small or long, large focal ratios. And they only magnified about three times. So here's a picture of these three J Dutch gentlemen who were really in a legal battle to get a patent on the telescope. And the Dutch government did not award the patent to any of them, but uh, Hans Lippersche actually got a contract from the Dutch government to make telescopes for them, uh, probably for military use. Uh, so he probably was uh, a little farther ahead than the others in credibility to be the first person to uh, invent a telescope. Uh, Lippershe and Jansen also were credit credited with inventing the first microscopes, which were actually built in the, the 1590s also. Of course, we all know Galileo Galilei was the first uh, optical astronomer. Uh, he built his telescope in 1609. His first instrument only had a magnification of 3x. Uh, he went on to build a couple larger instruments, one with 8x and one with 30x. And he published some of his uh, first works in astronomy in his book, uh, Sidereus Annuncius, The Starry Messenger, in March of 1610. Now, these early telescopes only had a single lens objective. It was a convex lens with a single concave lens eyepiece. They had very large uh, F numbers, which is the focal length divided by the objective diameter. And they all suffered severely from chromatic aberration. And so as time went along, um, you know, uh, opticians were looking at how can we eliminate this chromatic aberration? You know, telescopes would be much improved if we can find a way to eliminate it. Galileo was the first to suggest using mirrors instead of lenses for telescopes. Uh, you know, knowing that mirrors would not suffer from chromatic aberration. And on the left here, I show really what chromatic aberration does in a single lens. Your red, green, and blue will all focus at different uh, focal points on the uh, back side of the lens. And uh, early lenses also, also um, suffered from spherical aberration in that light rays that pass through different parts of the lens might come to focus at a different point than other parts of the lens. So it just, these just tended to blur the images. Well, James Gregory, a Scottish mathematician, uh, one of many uh, Scots who I'll talk about tonight, uh, was the first to show in 1661 that you can eliminate spherical and chromatic aberration with parabolic mirrors. Unfortunately, back then, nobody really knew how to make a parabolic mirror, uh, but uh, Gregory designed, um, on paper at least, a. Um, a telescope with a parabolic mirror. 
and it looked more like a modern day Cassegrain than it did a Newtonian. Of course, the, um, the first reflector was actually made by Isaac Newton. And uh, Isaac Newton was, um, was a mathematician and a, a natural philosopher in uh, England. And he actually built three telescopes. Uh, his first telescope was kind of a prototype. It had a one inch mirror, a 6.25 inch focal length. And uh, he was not proud of it at all. He didn't want to show it to anybody. So basically he tossed it. And uh, then he built another telescope, which he always called his first telescope, but the second one he made, uh, the one he called his first telescope was actually the second one he made in the year 1671. This telescope had a two inch diameter mirror with the six and a half inch focal length. And there's sort of a, a cartoon of it, a drawing of it here on the right side. Uh, this telescope focused by adjusting the length of the tube. So there was a little screw on the um, back of the primary mirror cell there, which you turned and it would, it would expand or contract the length of the tube. Uh, so the eyepiece was actually fixed in there. And uh, notice the, uh, the ball mount uh, that he used for these prototype telescopes. Uh, this telescope, um, uh, all of these telescopes did not have glass in them. They were just shaped, shaped metal. So uh, his prototype had tin and copper. This uh, second telescope had tin, copper, and some silver in it. This telescope did not survive past the year 1781. <clears throat> and then his last telescope, he completed in 1672. It was the same, um, same size as the, uh, the second one he built just a little bit better mirror in it. And he made his tubes out of rolled and pasted paper. And it was a single lens, plano convex eyepiece that had a focal length of about five eighths of an inch. Uh, so the magnification of, of these Newtonian telescopes were only about 10 X, give or take. I, I haven't done the math in my head, but uh, close to that. Now, Isaac Newton made no other telescopes. All he wanted to do was prove that a reflecting telescope did not suffer from chromatic aberration. He really had no interest in, in being an observational astronomer. So uh, the telescope did not have chromatic aberration. He proved his point. He was done being an astronomer or a telescope maker. Now, Newton, um, great mathematician, great physicist, known for, um, for optics and um, the law of gravity and uh, his laws of motion. But he actually got inducted into the Royal Society, not for his science or mathematic uh, findings, but for building the first reflecting telescope. And his telescopes actually had spherical mirrors. Uh, Newton didn't know how to make a parabolic mirror. So um, uh, it was another 50 years before someone um, figured out how to make a, 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 a good enough figured parabolic mirror to use in a telescope. Okay, the, um, the um, next um, innovation in telescope uh, was actually um, um, building the first parabolic telescope. And um, for some reason, my Zoom here is covering up John Hadley's name. I hope it wasn't covering up for you guys, too. Um, it was on my screen. No, we were fine here, actually. It's fine. Okay, you were fine there. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know how to get rid of all of our, our pictures that are covering up the right half of my screen here, either. Um, but uh, I can see most of uh, what's on my slides. Hopefully nobody else is having that same problem too. No, we're, we're all fine. You can, you can click on the grid button to get uh, the, the single button next to the grid next to um, get rid of oh, the grid people. Yeah, yeah. I see it. Okay, let's see. I got it. I minimized it. Yeah. Thank you for that help. Um, I don't do Zoom very often. Uh, okay, um, Hadley was also the inventor of the octant, which was the precursor to the sextant. So he built this first parabolic mirror telescope in 1721. Uh, it was a Gregorian design, so the secondary passed the light back through a hole in the primary mirror to the eyepiece. Uh, this mirror probably had less spherical aberration than Newton's telescope. Uh, but it probably suffered from coma. He might have been the first person to, to deal with uh, coma in a parabolic telescope. This telescope had a two-inch primary mirror and a 14-inch focal length, so it was an F7 focal ratio, so hopefully the coma wasn't bad. It typically is not too bad visually in an F7 telescope. 
And thus we have the first parabolic telescope. Okay, the Cassegrain telescope was the next um, parabolic telescope that was invented by Laurent Cassegrain, who was a French priest. He actually never built one of these. He just designed it on paper. And so um, the design went many years uh, without being used. And then we all know today that um, the Cassegrain telescopes are still very popular in some form or another. And this schematic shows the differences between uh, the Gregorian tele telescope, the Newtonian telescope, and the Cassegrain telescope. Uh, the Gregorian telescope, uh, the secondary mirror is a converging mirror, and it's placed outside of the focal length of the primary mirror versus the Cassegrain, where the secondary mirror is a diverging mirror, and it's placed inside of the focal length of the primary mirror. And that allows the Cassegrain to give you effectively a, a higher magnification than you would get uh, for the same um, size telescope, say in a Newtonian. Of course, in the Newtonian, we've all used those, and it's got the primary uh, parabolic primary mirror and the flat secondary, which uh, beams the uh, focus point out to the side of the telescope tube. So these are the three earliest uh, telescope designs and uh, still in use today. Okay, James Short was probably the first guy to mass produce telescopes. Uh, Scottish mathematician, uh, you guys may know more about him than I do because he's from Edinburgh and he made his first telescopes there. And in his career, he built over 1300 telescopes. Uh, many of those he built in London. He eventually moved to London because he determined there was a better market for selling telescopes in London than there was in Scotland. And uh, in 1737, he made the world's largest telescope at that time. It was a four and a half inch uh, Gregorian type uh, telescope. Uh, he left an estate when he died in 1767 of, of 20,000 pounds. And uh, as you know, that was a lot of money back then. Uh, the The... Uh, making of telescopes between Galileo and, say, the year 1733 improved considerably. But other than the innovations I've already mentioned, there really weren't many new innovations. Just making better glass and better figures was what was going on. But all the refractors were still single element, and most of the telescopes were still refractors. And then um, Chester Moore Hall came around, who was a British lawyer uh, born in the early 18th century. And he invented the first acromat lens. He got the idea of building an acromat by studying the human eye. And um, he built what he called the first telescope free from color distortions in 1733. Now, if you've ever used an acromat, we all know there's still chromatic aberration going on in acromat, especially if you pointed at bright stars, planets, or the moon. But compared to what everybody was looking through before 1733, this was a vast improvement in the views through a telescope. And, uh, and he made his telescope with two lenses out of crown and flint glass. Many acromats today are still built with crown and flint glass, the, the lower costing ones. And his telescope was two and a half inch um, objective and it was an F8. And uh, he didn't actually make the lenses. He had an optician who worked for him named George Bass. And George Bass actually made the lenses for this telescope. I think I have a picture of Hall and Bass on the next slide. Okay, there they are. Uh, the only picture I could find of Bass. Uh, then um, the next big telescope maker in history was John Dolan, an English telescope maker. And he actually received the first patent for an acromat. And he made telescopes with his son, Peter, Peter Dolland, and that company apparently is still in business today. I don't know anything about the company today, but uh, you can still find them on the internet. And here's a picture of Peter Dolland. Now, uh, son Peter um, was the first uh, person to make an apochromat. So he made the apochromat in 1763. And once you get that triplet lens in there, uh, you can pretty much eliminate chromatic aberration. So still throughout the um, 18th and 19th centuries, refractors were the most popular telescopes. And um, here's a slide of a 
acromat and apocromat. Uh, an acromat is a doublet with uh, this one is with crown and flint and glass, and it gets the uh, the red, the green, and the blue closer to the same focal length. And then with the three lenses that you have in an apocromat, uh, you actually can get all red, green, and blue, which pretty much gives you the whole visible spectrum come into focus at the same focal point. Uh, today, the apoc apocromats are still made, uh, but they typically, the higher end ones will throw in a, at least one or if not more elements of um, uh, low dispersion glass to help um, help look better for the for the color correction. Okay, we're not sure who built the first um, parabolic Newtonian telescope, um, but credit is given to William Herschel. And Herschel built and sold a lot of telescopes in his day. Uh, he made a lot of six inch F14 Newtonians and an eight inch 15 Newtonians. Still, they were using speculum mirrors, which basically had no glass, it was just shaped metal. Uh, we all know that uh, Herschel discovered a lot of uh, the objects in the NGC catalog, the new general catalog. And he found a lot of these objects using this 18.7 inch F12.8 Newtonian that he built, which is pictured in the drawing on the bottom of this slide. Most of his telescopes had pretty large focal ratios. The larger focal ratios really helped reduce the coma in a Newtonian and other aberrations. Uh, this telescope had a 20 foot long focal length. So you had to climb a ladder to get to the eyepiece. Uh, what else I could say about Herschel? Um, oh, this 18.7 inch telescope he built. Uh, I did a calculation a few years ago. Um, I made an estimation of uh, what the reflectivity was of his mirrors and the transmission of the eyepieces that were used in that era. And I determined that his limiting magnitude with this 18.7 inch telescope was about the same as an eight inch uh, modern telescope, say an eight inch Schmidt cast green. You'd be seeing about the same number of stars as um, as uh, Herschel could through his 18.7 inch telescope. Because we have better glass now, better reflection uh, uh, off the mirrors and better eyepieces than he had back then. James, what does OTA mean? Oh, OTA, optical tube assembly. That's what he. That's what he called it, is it? No, that's what um, manufacturers now just call the op optical tube assembly of a telescope today. Um, you know, the oh. just the, the tube without the mount. That's called the optical tube assembly. Okay, thank you. Uh, forgive me for using an acronym I didn't define. I'm usually better than that. Herschel built a couple of larger telescopes too. He built a 24 inch and a 48 inch. And at the time, these were the biggest, biggest ever made. Uh, the picture on the left is a picture of the uh, drawing of the 48 inch F10 telescope. Uh, and as you can see in that telescope and the one on the previous slide, they all had out azimuth mounts. So you were using pulley system and lines to raise the telescope up and down. And then he actually had a whole staff to rotate this telescope so he didn't have to come down from the ladder to rotate it. They would rotate it till he told them it was in the right spot. And um, th th basically, uh, that was the first go-to telescope. You know, you just had people moving it for you instead of it motors. And then, of course, he built this six and a quarter inch uh, telescope pictured on the right here, still in existence today. And he used this to discover Uranus on March 13th, 1781. Now, the problem with these long optical tube assembly telescopes is keeping them collimated was difficult. Uh, the tubes tended to have flexure in them, uh, which would, would hurt the collimation. You raise it up to a higher elevation, the tube flexes differently than a lower elevation, and then there goes your collimation. Uh, support issues and tracking issues. Um, so, um, you know, Newtonians were still um, losing out to refractors um, after acromats and apochromats were invented for the most popular telescopes to use. All right, uh, uh, another innovation uh, in telescopes was uh, Leon Foucault, a uh, famous physicist who um, uh, we've all probably heard about. He actually made the first telescope mirror using glass. So he ground his own mirror, coated it with silver, and thus we had what would be similar to a modern day reflector, 
a glass coated glass mirror. So on the left is a four inch uh, telescope he made and on the right is a drawing of a, um, an 80 centimeter telescope that he made. And you'll notice in that 80 centimeter telescope, there's actually an equatorial mount there. So some of the early equatorial mounts were starting to come into play then. Uh, of course, um, Leon is also famous for inventing the polarizer, the rack and pinion focuser, which we all love today. He invented the gyroscope and of course the knife edge testing of mirrors, which is still used today among many other um, inventions here. And of course the pendulum shown in the middle picture, you've probably seen one of these in a museum if you don't own your own, um, they're always fun to watch. All right, no one knows who invented um, uh, you know, the first equatorial mounts or the clock drives, but early early clock drives use falling weights similar to those in a grandfather clock. Uh, I remember um, 50 years ago uh, when I was at university, we had an observatory with a telescope in there with a mechanical driven gravity clock drive in it that still was operational. So it's kind of cool to see how those worked. Uh, very accurate. I was impressed. Once you uh, cr cranked up that weight and let it start falling, it would track quite well. Robert Hooke, um, English uh, physicist, was the first to propose telescope clock drives in 1670. And then Cassini was the first to build one that actually had setting circles on it uh, so that you can find your way from one place in the sky to another place in the sky. And then German equatorial mounts were the next um, innovation in telescopes. They were invented by Joseph von Fraunhofer, uh, another optician. Uh, he, he made a lot of lighthouse lenses in his career or invented them at least. So that's another thing he's famous for. And uh, this was one of the oldest uh, known German equatorial mount telescopes, the great Dorpat refractor. Uh, it was a nine and a half inch acromat, 14 foot focal length, nice uh, wood tube on that one. And in 1824, this was the world's largest refractor. James, what are the two long brass tubes either side of the main tube? Um, I, I think they probably had something to do with um, focusing. Because I, I, I honestly don't know for sure. Um, either focusing or um, slow motion controls around the axes. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've never visited where this telescope is to see what those are used for or, or used a similar telescope. Thank you. Um, now, gravitational clock drives were very popular even, even into the 20th century. This uh, picture is of a 15 inch Cook refractor that was uh, made in 1885. Uh, the telescope at the time was in the Wigglesworth Observatory in Scarborough, England. Now at the end of the 19th century, um, two of the best known telescope fam manufacturing families in the world were Alvin Clark and Sons in Cambridgeport, Massachusetts, and Thomas Cook and Sons in York, England. And both of these um, families made some of the highest quality refractors, uh, so good that many are still in use today. So it was, it was quality over innovation that they're famous for. A couple photos here uh, on the right at the top here is an eight inch Cook refractor at the University of London Observatory that was refurbished in 1997. On the left is an eight inch Clark reflect, excuse me, refractor that we believe was first installed at the US Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland in 1885. A little history of that scope. I was a professor at the Naval Academy from 1987 to 1991. And um, that telescope was no longer in existence and they found the optics to it. Uh, in the sub basement in the dormitory. And so um, we have the telescope refurbished and built to its original specifications, put it in a dome and we had first light in 1991. So an eight inch F12 Clark refractor. Uh, I was the first one to take photographs through this telescope. It was quite fun shooting images of the moon and the planets. 
Of course, the largest refractor ever built is at the Yerkes Observatory in the state of Wisconsin. And it was an Alvin and Clark uh, telescope built in 1896. It's a crown and flint acromat, 62 foot plus focal length. The diameter of that dome is 90 feet. Uh, it has a lift in it, so the floor goes up and down, depending on whether you're pointing the scope toward the horizon or pointing it toward the zenith. Uh, you can go up and down several stories. I did look through this telescope at Saturn once. Uh, the views were not that great because the 40-inch um, the um, objective lens that takes so long to reach thermal equilibrium, it really never reaches thermal equilibrium, so the, the heat currents destroy the view and the dome is so big, they don't really air condition the dome to keep the optics at ambient outside temperatures. There were fewer than 25 refractors ever made, greater than 25 inches in diameter. Uh, the reason for that is the weight of the glass is so great, even if it's only a doublet, it's very difficult to support. Uh, Nobody wanted to do doublets because of the chromatic aberration anyway. Two flexures were, were really problematic. L large domes were required with elevated floors and just they're costly to make, maintain and operate. So, so the 40 inch was the biggest made and uh, there's not too many others around surviving in use that are 25 inches or larger in size. So, th throughout most of the early 20th century, Cassegrain's and Newtonian's became the most popular telescopes, especially for professional use. Uh, here's a 40 centimeter telescope pictured here. Uh, we had this same telescope also at the Naval Academy in Annapolis when I was there, uh, which has since been decommissioned. Uh, they have parabolic primary mirrors and hyperbolic secondary mirrors. Uh, most of these Cassegrain's came in F12 or greater focal length. Uh, these large focal ratios, excuse me, were, were needed to minimize coma. And fork and yoke mounts became popular in the 20th century. And then early 20th century uh, came along two astronomers. Uh, one was George Willis Ritchie in the United States and Henri Crétien in France. And they invented what we know today as the Ritchie Crechian telescope. So the Ritchie Crechian uses hyperbolic mirrors for both the primary and the secondary. Of course, hyperbolic mirrors are more expensive to make than spherical or parabolic mirrors. It's just, just a more difficult process to get a correct figure on those. But they have much less coma than a Cassegrain or a Newtonian. Uh, flatter fields uh, for some focal ratios. Uh, typically, these are made in focal ratios of F8 to F9. Uh, but even with F8 and F9, uh, I always use a field flattener if I'm imaging with a um, classical Cassegrain. Uh, visually, I've never seen coma in a cla classical Cassegrain. I do own a 25 centimeter one that's an F12, and uh, it has become my favorite telescope to look through. And here's a picture of a smaller Ritchie Cretchen. Um, in the middle here, uh, and the, the gentleman's picture, Kretchen is on the right, uh, Ritchie is on the left. And then another telescope design was invented by an English astronomer named Horace Dahl in 1928. Uh, his telescope design didn't become popular until an American named Alan Kirkham wrote about it in a magazine called Scientific American. And so uh, ever since that article came out in 1930, everybody calls this telescope design a Dahl Kirkham. Um, on your side of the pond, you may not give Kirkham name for this telescope design, but we do on this side of the big pond. But the Dahl Kirkham uses elliptical primary mirrors and spherical secondary mirrors. These telescopes has, have much less coma than either a Cassegrain or a Ritchie Cretchen, but they have to make them in focal ratios of F15 or larger focal ratios uh, to minimize all the aberrations in them. I've seen them between F15 and F20 focal ratios. And by the way, let me back up just a second. I think I forgot to mention about the Ritchie Cretchen. That's, this is the telescope design used in the Hubble Space Telescope, which is kind of important. 
uh, because Hubble did so many great things and still doing so many great things for advancing uh, astronomy. Uh, there's one last telescope design that came around um, uh, in the early uh, 20th century. It was called a three mirror astigmat, astigmat, excuse me. And uh, it was invented by a uh, French optician, Maurice Paul, and then 10 years later by James Baker. Um, the reason why they both invented it independently is there was a war going on in Europe between 1935 and 1945. So there wasn't a lot of correspondences going on between um, opticians then. Uh, but um, not too many of these have been made. Um, some of you may know a famous telescope that uses this design. Um, and since I can't see you raising your hands, I'll go ahead and give you the answer. The James Webb Space Telescope is a three mirror uh, anastigmat. It has um, an ellipsoidal primary, a hyperloidal secondary, and an ellipsoidal tertiary mirror in it. Now, um, we, we, we couldn't leave out um, Bernard Schmidt for being an inventor or an innovator in telescopes. And uh, Schmidt invented what we now call the schmidt cassegrain telescope, which uses a spherical primary mirror and a spherical secondary mirror, but it has a corrector plate over the end of the tube to eliminate spherical aberrations. Uh, they do, however, suffer from coma. So they're typically made in focal ratios of 10 or larger, or as I say here, F10 or slower, because the bigger the number, the slower it is photographically. And people, when they um, first got a hold of Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes, they, they discovered after photography was invented, well, long after photography was invented, that if you replace the um, secondary mirror with a camera, you, you have a very fast camera called a Schmidt camera. Uh, telescopes that use both lenses and mirrors are called catadioptrics, and there are many other catadioptrics in use today. Uh, Schmidt Cassegrains didn't become popular until the 1960s when a company called Celestron started mass producing them in California. Most people think that the original Celestron telescopes had an orange tube, but that's not true. The original Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes had white tubes with blue trim, and here are all the different sizes they made. Uh, six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, and a 22 inch uh, in their 1969 model season. Other companies that uh, came out in uh, the 1980s uh, building Schmidt Cassegrain, there were three companies, at least on, on this side of the Atlantic, who were making Schmidt Cassegrains. There was Criterion, made a Dynamax 8. They were in uh, East Hartford, Connecticut. They were eventually bought out by um, Bausch and Loam, and the telescope lines became Bushnell instead of Criterion. But Bushnell stopped making telescopes a few years after they bought out Criterion. Then Mead Telescope Company, also in California, uh, they made an eight inch telescope. One of their first models was the Mead 2080. And here's a orange tube, Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain. All these telescopes were from the mid 1980s. And um, I actually owned all three at one point in my life, not simultaneously. Uh, another popular telescope design still in use today is the Maksutov Cassegrain and invented by a Dutch optician named Albert Bowers in 1940 and also co-invented a year later by a Russian optical engineer named Dmitry Maksutov. Um, the Russians um, made most of these, so the name of the telescope design has Max Sutov's name on it. Uh, this uses um, spherical mirrors with a meniscus corrector plate, um, and the, the secondary mirror is actually attached on the inside of the corrector plate. Uh, they really do, they magnify your image considerably, even that over that of a Schmidt Cassegrain, so they're typically F15 and slower, very popular in Russia. The only company in the U.S. I know who's making them today is Questar. There are several companies making them in China that are labeled by various telescope brands. 
uh, that you'll find around the um, the world today. Questar um, sold a lot of these three and a half inch ones. They actually also had a seven inch in their inventory, although they haven't made seven inch ones in several decades. But you can still buy their their three and a half inch Maxutov Cassegrain. And there's a picture of uh, Dmitry there in his Russian military uniform. Other catadioptric designs, I'll talk about three more here real quick. The Maxutov Newtonian, um, it was not invented by any one person, but it was invented by a company in Russia called Intez Micro, which was founded in 1991. Uh, so these use a spherical mirror and a Newtonian instead of a parabolic mirror. So it needs a corrector plate over the end of it. And then um, a Schmidt Newtonian. There's really only one main difference between the Schmidt Newtonian and the um, Maxutov Newtonian. Uh, the corrector plate on the Maxutov Newtonian is inside of the primary mirror's focal length. And on the Schmidt Newtonian, it's outside of the primary mirror's focal length. So they have... Um, they have a slightly different design corrector plate on them. Uh, the only company I know that ever made Schmidt Newtonians was Mead Instruments. They made them for a few years, you know, a decade or two ago. Um, you can't hardly find one these days. Every now and then you'll see a used one uh, on eBay or somewhere else. Uh, Maxutov Newtonians are still being sold. Uh, Skywatcher is a company that sells them. Orion Telescope sells them, uh, maybe others. Uh, I own one of these. They operate like an APO as far as what they, how they perform. I would say my, I have, an, I have a 190 millimeter one. It's an F5.3, no coma or any aberrations whatsoever, a very flat field photographically. It's one of my favorite telescopes to use for imaging or visual use. I think between this and my 10 inch classical Cassegrain, uh, it's a toss. It's a coin toss, which one I enjoy looking through the most. Uh, but this one is better for imaging than the classical Cassegrain because of the flat field it has. And then here's a picture of my um, Maxutov Cassegrain. So you can see the corrector plate and um, the secondary mirror being held up by the corrector plate. There's vents in the end of the tube for cooling and vents on the back behind the primary mirror also for cooling. Uh, and I have rotating tube rings on mine, which which if you use Newtonians, you know, it's nice to be able to rotate the, the tube so the eyepiece is at a comfortable viewing height. The rings almost cost me half of what the telescope cost. And the last uh, design uh, telescope I want to talk about is the corrected Dahl Kirkham. So you take your, your classical Dahl Kirkham telescope and you put a group of lenses inside uh, in front of the right there inside of the focuser actually, and you correct the aberration. So instead of making an F15 Dahl Kirkham, you can turn this into an F8 corrected Dahl Kirkham. So it's optically much faster for imaging. And um, this one here is a picture of a 17.5 inch, uh, I don't recall how many centimeters that is, 43, somewhere around there, um, to F8 made by Plane Wave Instruments. They make all sizes of these. Uh, this is on a, a, a Paramount ME2 mount. This um, telescope is owned by a retired Stanford University physics professor uh, who has a vacation home on Kauai. This is in the same observatory complex where my observatory is on Kauai. This roll-off roof has three piers in it. Uh, and there's a couple domes outside of the roll-off roof building. Um, I have an eight inch um, of Richie Kretchen inside this roll off ref observatory and my 10 inch Newtonian is in one of the domes outside of this observatory. But corrected Dahl Kirkham's are great telescopes. Uh, one last design I'll talk about for refractors. Uh, you may have heard of a Petzval refractor. Well, the Petzval lens was originally developed for photography by Joseph Petzval in the year 1841. Uh, it was the first lens ever designed uh, using mathematics. Uh, Pretzel was a Hungarian mathematician and inventor and a physicist. So he invented this lens with, for, in the last half of the 19th century, uh, was one of the most popular lens designs for cameras, for high-end cameras. 
but it wasn't made into a telescope design until the 1980s when um, American Al Nagler came along. 1982, uh, Al Nagler made the first Teleview telescope. Uh, this Pressful design provides a very flat field. It's pretty much aberration free. Uh, no coma, um, no field curvature, no spherical aberration whatsoever. Here's a picture of Al. He's 85 or 86 now and still going strong. Uh, I think his son runs the company now. And then a couple innovations that don't really in involve new designs, but just um, just really creative ways of making fast photographic systems uh, out of schmidt cast grain telescopes. Uh, one was called the Hyperstar. You may be familiar with it. It's been around for a couple decades. Uh, it was invented by uh, Dean Koenig, uh, who formerly worked for Celestron. And there's a picture of a Hyperstar camera attached on a telescope there. Uh, basically, you take out the secondary, you put in a camera with a lens system in the camera, and you make your Schmidt cast grain into a sh very fast Schmidt camera. And then on the right uh, is a newer one from um, Celestron. It's called the, uh, the Rao Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph. Again, a couple Celestron guys, David Rao and Mark Ackerman. Uh, we call this the RASA for short. The RASA and the Hyperstar, the only difference uh, between the two is in the um, RASA, the um, corrective optics are inside of the corrector plate. And on the Hyperstar, it's outside of the corrector plate. But essentially, they're doing the same thing to make you a very fast, typically F2 uh, photographic system. Uh, low dispersion glass, extra low ED or super low uh, SD glass have revolutionized refractors in our current century. This glass is better at removing chromatic aberration in telescopes. Uh, the only difference with uh, or only drawbacks of using uh, ED or SD glass is it makes the refractor more expensive and it's less stable to temperature changes but I doubt very many of us own refractors that don't have ED or SD glass in it just because we like to get rid of all that chromatic aberration. <clears throat> Excuse me. Most of the glass used in these telescopes worldwide right now are Ohara glass or Hoya glass from Japan, different glass types known as FPL 51 and FPL 53 or FCD 10 or FCD 100 for Hoya glass. And if you look at the least chromatic aberration that you get with um, refractors, if you have a triplet with two ED glass elements, you're going to have the best color correction. Then a triplet with one ED element glass is the next best color correction. And then doublets with ED glass. Some of these doublets with ED glass, they're calling APOs. They're really not APOs because uh, they only have two glass elements in them. Some of them do a really good job of eliminating chromatic aberration. I've imaged with a lot of them. Some of them you see the chromatic aberration in them and some of them you don't. So it really depends on the quality of the um, optical work in the telescope, whether a doublet with ED truly eliminates chromatic aberration. The final um, slide I have here is a, is a relatively new innovation in telescopes. And the innovation isn't in the optical system and it isn't in the cameras, but it's how it's put together and it's how the software works to control this camera. And I, some of you may own one of these unistellar telescopes. <clears throat> I reviewed several of them for astronomy technology today over the last two years. But it's essentially, um, I think it's around a 110 inch uh, mirror, Newtonian, an F4. And instead of a secondary mirror, there's a camera there. There is no eyepiece. There's no way to look through it. Uh, you just take this outside and, and it's got built-in Wi-Fi inside of the fork arm. It's got um, a computer in there actually. It's got a GPS in there. You take it outside, you turn it on. Uh, it actually figures out your, your latitude, longitude and what time it is using GPS. Uh, the only thing you may have to do to it 
is focus it. The focusing knob is on the back of the primary mirror. The primary mirror moves in and out to focus it. So you can point it on a bright star. You have to do a calibration with it uh, to let it know where it's pointed in the sky. So you typically point it at 45 degrees and it will take a picture of the sky and it'll actually do a, um, a, a plate solve and figure out exactly what it's pointing at. And you control it with a phone or a tablet. Uh, it'll only work with an Android phone, an Android tablet, or an iPhone and an iPad. And I use an iPad to control mine. And what it'll do is it'll take an image and display it on your tablet. You can connect to it and be the controller on your tablet, have 10 other or nine other people can connect to it and they can see what you're looking at. So it's great for star parties if you want to just tell people, hey, connect to this Wi-Fi on your phone. And uh, they can all see what you're pointed at. It takes um, oh two to four second images, and it and you tell it if you want to start stacking them. It registers and stacks the images as in real time. After several minutes, even in light pollution suburbs, you can actually see color in nebulas, nebulae, as we say in Latin. Uh, you can uh, in minutes you can see things on your phone or your tablet that you cannot see because of the light gathering power of it with your naked eye through a telescope. Now, how well do the images come out that you take with it? Well, I have here two pictures of M22 I took. The one on the upper left is a picture I took in Hawaii at my observatory with the four inch 7.9 APO. It was a 40 minute exposure, five minute subframes. I had to do darks and flats. I had to process them all on my computer. So basically to get this picture, it took me four hours of data collection and about um, an hour of image processing from a site with no light pollution. On the right is a three minute exposure taken within the city limits of Bryan, Texas, where I am right now. Light polluted backyard, uh, didn't do any processing. The only thing I did to both of these images is I rotated them so they were oriented the same way. And I did make them both monochromatic because the, the color was difficult to see on the slide to compare the color of the two images. Now, at this scale, the images look virtually identical. So three minutes versus a couple hours. Um, the images that come out of the Unistellar are not really the same quality as you can get with an APO with a CCD camera. But for most people who aren't picky astro amateurs, the fact that they can just sit in their house while this thing's sitting outside in the cold in the garden and uh, they can do imaging and, um, and see things they could not see otherwise. So, so these smart telescopes, I think, are a new wave coming in telescopes. I said at the Astronomical League meeting when I presented this talk last July, I said, my prediction is within the next year, you're going to see other manufacturers building scopes like this, and they're going to be making them larger than four inches. Well, Celestron has just announced one that they're taking pre-orders for that will be available in April. That is a RASA telescope, six inch along the same design as the Unistellar telescope. So Sasson's jumping on the bandwagon and we'll see other companies I'm sure jumping on this bandwagon too. Will this replace all the works many of us do with our, our um, larger telescopes with CCD cameras? No, it won't, but it's gonna bring astronomy into a lot more homes than astronomy has been in in many decades. And with the graying of most astronomy clubs around the world, it may even bring in younger people uh, to start enjoying uh, amateur astronomy as we all do. Well, this is the end of my talk. I thank you very much for your time and attention this evening. Well, thank you very much for that, James. That is that's really good. Before we uh, move on to questions, can we thank James for his talk? Um, in terms of uh, that, James, that is that's really good. Before we uh, move on to questions, can we thank James for his talk? Oh, got a, a bit of an echo there. Um, right. Um, uh, in terms of... Uh, that, James, I'm not sure. Yeah, there we go. Um, 
Yes, can, if you've got a question for James, can you put it into um, the, put your name in the chat, please, and, and we'll read that. And if you're on YouTube, can you do that as well? Oh, yeah, no, um, no, you're pretty no, you're no, pretty no, converted no, no, no. with the um, smart scopes, definitely, because there's a lot of people who who bought them very recently um, in, in the society. So there's no doubt about that. And it's it's great to hear all the all the all the names behind all the innovations and telescopes that, that we that we know about so um, that, that's really good thank you um have we got questions please uh, peter are you going to read out the questions for us i, I don't see any yet just a second uh, i think we have one from nigel actually nigel, yeah that's your question yeah. uh yes uh, uh thank you james for a fascinating uh talk uh i didn't realize the actual uh um sort of design of the telescope on the James Webb. But that's something I hadn't come across before. Um, my, my question was, uh, most innovations uh, recently uh, have, seem to be in the areas of electronics and software. Uh, do you think there are any new and in optical uh, innovations still out there to be invented? That's a great question, Nigel. Um, I honestly don't think there'll be any major um, new inventions in telescope optics. I think we've kind of run the end of the course there on how you could possibly put together lenses or mirrors or lenses and mirrors to make optical systems. I think everything possible has been tried and it either worked or did not work. I could be wrong, but that's just my, my feelings on the question. Okay, thank you. I, th I think um, going through all the different designs of the telescopes, I can. I'm looking at people on this grid here, and I thought, yeah, he's just bought that one. He's bought a Rasa. He's got the Maxi Top and the um, and Ian's just bought himself a new Richie Critian today, I believe, Ian. <laughs> so there we go. And and I've been reviewing telescopes for a dozen years uh, for a magazine called Astronomy Technology Today. I don't know if many of you subscribe to that. It's it's an online magazine now. Uh, it'll cost you six US dollars a year. So it's not expensive. It used to be a paper magazine that was mailed to everybody. But um, so pretty much every type of telescope I've discussed, I have either owned one or been sent one by a manufacturer to review. <laughs> and uh, uh, the magazine has a request for one of the new Celestron smart telescope that's coming out in April to send one my way. I uh, see, you're not gonna hold one yet then, Jim? No, they, they haven't actually, um, started uh releasing any yet they're taking pre-orders for april i know it's just two new unicellar ones out as well in the last couple of weeks have you are you gonna have a go at them uh probably not um unicellar and i have parted ways all right i won't go into why <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Francis has a question here. Uh, thank you very much. Sea Star and Dwarf Two Smart Scopes are very popular here in Edinburgh, but you didn't mention those. Do you know much about those? Any comments on those? Okay, thank you for that question. I do not know much about them. Uh, as I said at the talk of my start of my talk, as a disclaimer, I would probably miss some innovations, uh, and so a lot of European products don't make it into the U.S. Uh, Unistellar is one of the first ones that have come in recently where they're actively trying to market in the U.S. because of our population size. Uh, but some of these other makes uh, don't don't come into the U.S. for some reason. Uh, they are actually Chinese, Chinese, I think, aren't they? Yeah, they, they may be Chinese. Uh, I, I, I'm just not familiar with the name. They may be packets under a different name in the U.S. then. Maybe that's it. That, that's possible, yeah. I suppose, no, but Z ZWO are, are a fairly big, big uh, Chinese maker that I think you know make it into America. So it's surprising that that you haven't heard of that. It's very, very interesting. Uh, the the dwarf two certainly um, in this country started it off. I think that I mean, well, Unistellar were around first of all, but in terms of budget friendly, the dwarf two certainly was. It was, it was very cheap. But then ZWO jumped on that, and as I said, I think. Everyone you can see on the screen just about bought one this Christmas, or, or not quite everyone, but a lot, a lot of people certainly did. So, yeah. Well, the um the, the Chinese are really trying to make the best telescopes in the world now. I, I you probably have heard of William Optics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they are out of Taiwan, and then there's a new company, relatively new, called Askar A S K A R, yeah. making telescopes out of Xinjiang, China, which is a suburb of Shanghai, which I did have the opportunity to visit Xinjiang 
in 2009. And, uh, but they were still using Japanese glass. <clears throat> uh huh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now there are, there are lots of different, um, brand names, but I think a lot of them come from either Skywatcher or, um, GSO, I think are the other one who, who manufacture a lot of, a lot of them. Yes. Just get, get rebranded. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. DSO is making the only classical class of grains that I know of being built on the planet right now. Yes, yes, makes some very nice ones. Yeah. Have we any other, uh, any other questions for for James? Uh, have we anything on on YouTube, Will? 